Praise the Lord. Everybody, I said, Praise the Lord. Everybody say amen. amen. Let's rise up as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for such a glorious, wonderful day. Thank you for the things you have done since morning, since we came. We bless your name because you've led us thus far. Thank you for your hand upon us. Thank you for your word you open to every one of us. Thank you for receptive hearts. And thank you because you are the burden bearer. And we know you will wipe all tears away. All these brothers and sisters who are here, outside, inside, whatever persecution they are going through, whatever affliction they are going through, oh Lord, we pray that your supernatural power will lead them above the stormy waters in Jesus' name. And Lord, we pray comfort from heaven, solace from heaven, and consolation from heaven. You will grant unto all your people in Jesus' name. Amen. We will not be weary. Amen. We will not be tired. Amen. Your spirit will carry us on in Jesus' name. Amen. I pray that everyone here today, they will go from strength to strength. Amen. And from power to power, Amen. we'll be strong in the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you. You can sit now. We're looking at Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, we now come to verse 9. Matthew chapter 5. We're looking at it from verse 9 all through to verse 12. Matthew 5, reading from verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you. And shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Here we come again to the Sermon on the Mount. And we find the Lord Jesus Christ painting a picture. And they strike me, the blessed man. And he goes from milestone to milestone. He goes from point to point. And then he outlines for us the path of the blessed ones. I've said it over and over now. When it says blessed, it means happy. It means fortunate. It means favored. It means heaven's smile is upon you. And who are these people that have heaven's favor? Heaven's smile. And they have the grace and the mercy of God. It starts by giving us a false milestone. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You see, in the sight of God, humility, very, very important. Pride gets us far away from the Lord. But being poor in spirit, being humble in spirit, being contrite in spirit, bowing low and bending down before the Almighty God, that wins the favor of God. In fact, it opens the, the doors of the kingdom and we enter into the kingdom of God. But then after you have entered into the kingdom, you have the nature of God. And it's the nature of righteousness. You love righteousness and you hate evil. And evil is all around. And because of all the evil around, it sets you grieving. It sets you mourning. And it's an identification with the Lord. Because the Lord sees all the evil in the world. And when he sees all those evil in the world, then he mourns. It's sad. And because of that sadness, now you are a child of God, a citizen of the kingdom, in identification with the Lord, because he grieves, because of the old evil in the world, you also grieve with him, you sorrow with him, and you mourn with him. That's why it says, until you are poor in spirit, and you have not entered into the kingdom by that gauge of mercy, and grace, and love, and faith. 
Now you mourn for the Lord. And it says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. For then, as you are comforted, and you know you owe everything you have unto the Lord. Then he tells us, Blessed are the meek, like sheep, lowly, gentle, submissive, unruffled. He says, Blessed are such meek people, because they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, your passion. Your desire, your longing becomes this righteousness, the nature of the Almighty God. And it says, For they shall be filled. And blessed are the merciful. You begin to learn that when you become a child of God, this nature of God, the nature of love, the nature of compassion, the nature of mercy. The nature of showing grace comes to you. And this nature then makes you to understand the pattern of God's mercy. And that pattern of God's mercy becomes the pattern and the practice of your life. And you say, if God could show such great mercy, such great love, such great compassion upon me, what am I going to do? Personal gratitude. Then leads you to the ministry of mercy. And then he showed that mercy in the word of the Lord, in the nature of the Lord. And then you show that mercy as God would have shown it. And you understand it is mercy and truth, not mercy isolated from truth. And then he tells us after that mercy now, he says, Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god and what a great privilege to be a child of god and to have the purity of heart that you see god at every bend every turn of the way when you pray you see god when you are walking you see god when you are relaxing you see god when you read the bible you see the revelations of god blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god and now he comes to this one, pure in heart. After that purity of heart, there is something that then interests you. And this is part of the nature of God. It says, blessed are the peacemakers, because they shall be called the children of God. And then it says, after that, blessed are the peacemakers. You will see that anybody that gives himself, Anybody that gives herself to the ministry, to the work, to the job of peacemaking, you'll think that such an individual will never have any problem. But have you forgotten that Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, is the chief peacemaker, is the one that has come to make peace between us and God. He is the mediator of the new covenant and he holds the hand of God and he holds the hand of man and he brings us together. And this greatest of all peacemakers, the chief peacemaker, he had problem, he had conflict. And people didn't like him or appreciate him just because he even gave his life to make peace with the people of the world, with everybody, and then link them all to God. That means then, even though you are a peacemaker, even though you have the nature of Christ, the nature of love, the nature of peace, and you become a peacemaker, reconciling man to man, and man to God, or God to man. Yet he says, there's going to be a problem, persecution. That's why it says, even after that, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. But this is the kingdom of heaven. In verse 10, blessed are they. That looks general. But now, it comes in particular and it singles you out. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. It says it's coming. Expect it. People will insult you. People will abuse you. 
people will say all manner of evil against you falsely don't be surprised and take it as a strange thing in fact it says when that happens it says rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for that's how they persecuted the prophets that were before you you actually come into the into the company of the people that have lived before and they were persecuted therefore it says rejoice we're talking about profiting from persecution profiting from persecution see these makers here peacemakers they are not the individuals organizations who make settling personal or national conflicts as a profession you know there are some people that are raised up as a committee of peacemakers as a panel of peacemakers or sometimes they call them peacekeepers they send into a particular country there is a conflict between this tribe and that tribe and because of that conflict another country will get interested like what's happening in sudan like what happened in liberia like what happened in sierra leone like what happened in ivory coast and then they sent these people to bring them together it's a great job that those politicians do somebody has to do it but that's not what jesus is talking about here he's talking about the people who are citizens of the kingdom he's talking about people who have received comfort at the morning and he's talking about people who have had their own broken relationship or fellowship reconciled with god you have mended your own broken fellowship and relationship and now he says after that you even became meek and gentle you have been cleansed and come and conform to the meek lamb of god their thirst for righteousness has been satisfied and their chief pursuit is still purity of life now as true children of god they become merciful and peaceful and even persecution conflict misunderstanding pressure cannot change the spiritual stage the state of love and the state of peace and peace of mind and compassion for others appreciated or persecuted that doesn't matter to them they are still peace lovers and peace makers and so in your life there's a way you can derive benefit and derive profit even from your challenges and trials and persecution and let's look at second corinthians chapter 12 second corinthians chapter 12 i'm reading from verse 9 in second corinthians chapter 12 verse 9 and he said unto me my grace is sufficient for thee will there be persecution yes how will you scale through how will you overcome my grace is sufficient for you will there be conflicts with the unbelieving world yes will there be insult and abuse yes are there times when the road will appear rough yes how will you still keep going because my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in weakness most gladly therefore will i rather glory in my infirmities that the power of christ may rest upon me therefore i take pleasure in infirmities in reproaches in necessities in persecutions in distresses for christ's sake for when i am weak then am i strong when i am weak then am i strong first timothy chapter 4 in first timothy chapter 4 i'm reading from verse 15 first timothy chapter 4 verse 15 meditate upon these things give thyself wholly to them that thy prophet may appear to all all these words of god we're hearing all these messages the lord is storing in our heart it says meditate on them don't meditate on negative things don't meditate on things that are not helpful meditate on these words and then you give yourself wholly entirely completely unto them so that your profit your gain 
in the word of God may appear unto all take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine continue in them for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee profit him from persecution all your persecution will be a gain for you Amen. will be a profit for you Amen. I divide the message to three parts number one the practice of peace making children of God the practice of peace making peace loving children of God number two persecution the persecution of peaceful children of God the persecution of peaceful children of God number three the prophet of persecuted children of God the prophet of persecuted children of God number one the practice of peacemaking children of God how do you become a peacemaker what do you do as a peacemaker what attitude you have as a peacemaker what are the methods and the approaches of a peacemaker when do you get involved in making peace the true child of god is a peacemaker if you're a true child of god you love peace you want peace you promote peace you work for peace you pray for peace and you do everything to maintain peace among people you detest utterly you abhor completely all strife all discord all fighting all contention you hate war because it's that that's not natural to man for man to kill man and to destroy one another a true child of God will detest it, will hate it, will reject it, will run away from it, will shun it. And if there is anything you can do as a child of God, you bring people together. You unite people together. You bring them in love together. And then as a child of God, you labor with all your might to prevent the fire of contention from being kindled. And where that fire of contention is already kindled, you endeavor to calm the stormy spirits of men and to quieten their turbulent passion and to soften the minds of contending parties and reconcile them to each other. That's the ministry of peacemaking. Let me show you in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 17. Romans chapter 12 verse 17 recompense to no man evil for evil that's how to make peace to start with between you and other people be a peacemaker be a peacemaker there are people that will do evil not everybody is born again in the world in your place of work in your community in the place where you live there are people that may not make life easy for you don't contribute to the fire burning stop the fire put out the fire how do you do that recompense to no man evil for evil provide six honest in the sight of all men if it be possible as much as it lies in you live peaceably with all men that's how to be a peacemaker you make up your mind in this place where i'm living it doesn't matter the attitude of the people living there i am going to be the center and the source and the spring of peace in this community as much as possible live peaceably with all men dearly beloved avenge not yourselves that's how to make peace that's how to make peace you see if other people are making trouble with you in your community and then you fold your hand and you wear a smile on your face and you don't appear like somebody wants to throw a rock back or want to apply the sword like they are applying they'll get tired and they will not continue that kind of conflict that kind of contention that kind of violence and that kind of fighting 
avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto all. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if an enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt keep coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil. Don't allow the devil to give you his nature just because he sends some of his children some of his servants to make uh, to make life hard and tough for you don't allow the devil to convert you from christ unto satan from peace unto contention and from love unto hatred you are converted already and the lord has taken you away from the hand of satan and you now belong to the lord you belong to the prince of peace don't allow the people, the servants of Satan, the children of Satan to put so much, much pressure upon you and overcome you with evil. But overcome evil with good. Chapter 14 of Romans. Romans 14. Reading from verse 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace. That is have a principle in your life now i'm born again now i'm a child of god now the prince of peace abides and lives in me and because the prince of peace abides and lives in me i'm going to allow him the prince of peace to move me to influence me to affect me to energize me and to control everything i do everything i say then if that is the case you are going to follow after the things that make for peace and the things wherewith one may edify another that's how to be a peacemaker that everything you do everything you say everywhere you go every interaction you have it is so that you will edify the other person that means you will promote love in his heart you will lead him and direct him into the ways of righteousness i read this passage to you yesterday i'm going to read it again genesis chapter 13. in genesis chapter 13 we're reading from verse 8 peacemaking the practice of peacemaking children of god genesis chapter 13 verse 8 and abram said unto lord let there be no strife i pray thee between me and thee that's a peacemaker and between my hard men and thy hard men this a peacemaker for we are brethren we are brethren it says it's not the whole land before thee what are we fighting on is the land that the animals the herdsmen were fighting on so that we'll be able to have our animals graze, graze, graze all, the, all the grass they need. That's what we're fighting on. The whole land is before you. Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lord lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan. That it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zohar. Then Lord chose him, all the plain of Jordan. And Lord journeyed his, and they separated themselves, the one from the other. And Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan. And Lord dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent towards Sodom. Now you see the peacemaker there, he took the initiative. He knew that the fire of contention was burning already. And he didn't say, God will take care of it. I know I didn't start it. I know I'm not at fault. And I know my right. And the young man is just trying to be funny because God called me and then I called him on and I brought him on and this young man is just, is just trying to take what doesn't belong to him I was showing after all he cannot pray I am the one that knows how to pray 
and all these blessings everything you see actually everything belongs to me but he didn't say that he took the initiative if you are a peacemaker you are not going to wait for the younger person or for the older person or for the person you think you have advantage over to take the initiative and solve the problem you take the initiative if you're a peacemaker abram took the initiative and he called him and you know they will sometimes when there's conflict some people don't know how to talk anymore they say well you know anytime there's any conflict like that i'm not angry i'm not offended but i just don't know how to talk when those people begin to make their trouble i i i just lose i lose my speech not abraham make an effort as a peacemaker and then call the other fellow you know that there are people when there is conflict they cannot look at one another eyeball to eyeball it's like that conflict bends their eyes down their face down and they're so either they are angry or they're unhappy or they are sad or they are sorrowful whatever it is they cannot look at you face to face if there is conflict let's look at one another face to face and let us say my brother what's the matter what's going on here are we going to tear one another apart we're not animals we're children of god have i offended you if i've offended you tell me now let's settle the thing here and now no i don't want to talk now you will talk this one you will talk and then when you take that initiative and you speak with understanding and you speak with love and you're willing to be cheated take whatever part of the land you want and whatever remains i will take his willingness to be cheated even in this situation then you're a peacemaker but to be fighting for your right how are you going to make peace like that if i'm fighting for my right you are fighting for your right trouble will never end contention will never end there'll never be peace how much time do we have on earth that we're going to stay in the fire of contention a brief time we have when are we going to enjoy the grace of god and the peace of god and all the good things the lord has given us look at us as we're here for example i'm trying to give you illustration this gathering here this gathering here just as we are here now we will never be together like this this year just this gathering all the people here and the people you're sitting with just this week it's a special week it's a unique week that this week will not be repeated in this whole year i'm going to stretch it forth this gathering here the way we are now we will never be exactly like this as we are here now no addition no subtraction for the rest of our lives this week is a week that will never be repeated again if it is so like that why don't you think how much time do we have here now that we're even going to waste a moment of time a minute of time for contention that's the reason why a child of god will take the initiative and say i'm going to put up this fire of contention i'm going to be a peacemaker because jesus said blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of god now that's talking about peace between you and the other fellow i about making peace between two other people you are not involved but you see them and they have conflict together and you need to make peace for samuel chapter 19 for samuel chapter 19 i read from verse 1 for Samuel chapter 19 verse 1 and Saul spake to Jonathan his son and to all the servants that they should kill David obviously between Saul and David there was conflict the fire of contention was burning very fiercely and Saul felt the only way this contention will end is for this young man to die and then he told all the people and his son jonathan anybody that finds david kill him look at verse 4 and jonathan speak good of david unto saul his father he knew he knew what the father had in mind 
but he had the ear of his father this is the peacemaker on the one hand he loved david on the other hand he knew his father and he knew when to get the attention of his father that's a peacemaker you study you study people you know people and you know that there is conflict in between them they may not announce it like saul announced his own they may not send you to kill them to kill david as saul made his own announcement and proclamation but you know just watching that it looks like saul and david are not really at peace together looks like something is happening and then when this jonathan at the ear of his father he spoke good of david unto saul his father and said unto him let not the king sin against his servant watch the language if you're a peacemaker your language will promote peace let not the king sin against a servant against david because he has not sinned against thee my father you trust me you know me i know david and i can tell you he doesn't have anything negative in his heart against you my father and so if you do anything against that innocent young man you'll be sinning against god and against the man and because his works have been to thee what very good he has been serving you he has been helping you this is a peacemaker he will not say any negative thing a peacemaker knows how to control his conversation how to direct his conversation so that this fire of contention will be put out and then he said for he did put his life in his hand and he slew the philistine and the lord wrought a great salvation for all israel thou sawest it and these rejoice wherefore then wilt thou sin against innocent blood to slay david without a cause and Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swear, As the Lord liveth, he shall not be slain. And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan showed him all those things, and Jonathan brought David to Saul. That's peacemaking. That's reconciliation. Joining them together, bringing them together again. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And he, David, was in his presence as in times past. As in times past, David came back again to the relationship they used to have. Judges chapter 8. In Judges chapter 8, we're looking at it from verse 1. And the men of Ephraim said unto him, Why hast thou served us thus, that thou callest not us, you called us not, when thou wentest to fight with the Midianites? And he did charge with him sharply. And he said unto them, What have I done now in comparison of you? Is not the gleaning of the graves of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? God has delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison of you? Then their anger was abated toward him when he had said that. That's a peacemaker. This is Gideon. He had won a great battle. And these people, these lazy people, they are not done so, they are not done much. And they knew that Gideon was going to battle. And he was fighting all the battle by himself. And the young man put his life in his hand. And almost died. Almost, you know, jeopardized his life. He came back. Instead of their rejoicing, they said, come here. Why did you go without telling us? Why did you call us to join you? Now he could have said, didn't you see it yourself? Didn't you know that the people of God are trouble? Why did you stay behind? When I made the announcement... And I said, those on the side of the Lord, all you come. And 32,000 people came. Before many of them were disqualified, where were you? He didn't say that. Sometimes logic will not make peace. If you're too logical, if you're too systematic, if you're proving a point, and you're saying you're at fault, 
showing people their fault does not necessarily solve the problem but he said uh -uh, you are chiding me you are rebuking me what have i done what victory do i have what success do i have in comparison with your success who am i am i not just you know a humble person from the house of my father look at what you have done and he exalted them and he praised them that's making peace when you don't exalt yourself above the person you're having conflict with even though you know what qualities you have that he may not have you also know qualities he has which you don't have you will exalt the qualities he has that you don't have and you will tell him how much you appreciate and, and you're sincere in that appreciation that's how to make peace but if we're logical i'm proving it to one another i'm better than you are stop talking you're lazy i have done everything i almost died in that battle so you don't have any mouth to talk to me you'll not make peace that way let's be peacemakers and see how to quieten the stormy spirits in the men and the women around us in proverbs chapter 15 proverbs chapter 15 verse 1 proverbs chapter 15 verse 1 is soft answer turneth away wrath is soft answer turneth away wrath and you know sometimes when we talk about a raw it is soft answer uh, you are just talk, you are thinking about the words we say that's true that's true sometimes we answer you by the word of mouth soft answer you know sometimes too there's body language that's the way we carry ourselves that's the way you stand and people think you are ready for a fight that's the way you stand and people feel that you are helpless that's the way you look and people think that you are ready to not fire for fire that's not the way you look and people see that you are a gentle lamb you know body language is very important when you are making peace with people they are angry they are frowning and then while they are frowning and they want to really get you then you smile you say my brother why are you acting like this my dear sister i know that i know you don't mean the way you act I, I think you are just trying to show me uh, your muscle i know that you are more gentle than this and then when you keep on smiling body language and then you talk some soft words it calms them down and then they understand we're not enemies there's no reason to fight Philemon has only one chapter Philemon we're looking at verse 10 you see in making peace you reconcile other people to Philemon reading from verse 10 I beseech thee for my son Onesimus whom I have begotten in my bonds which in time past was to thee unprofitable but now profitable to thee and to me whom i have sent again thou therefore receive him that he is mine own bowels whom i would have retained with me that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel but without thy mind would i do nothing that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity but willingly but perhaps it he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever not now as a servant but above a servant a brother beloved especially to me but how much more unto thee both in the flesh and in the lord if thou count me if thou therefore count me a partner receive him as myself here is paul pleading for nisimus he had offended philemon as a servant walking under him and he had drawn away from philemon and then paul in his missionary journey met this onesimus and onesimus became converted and he didn't just tell onesimus go and make your restitution go and reconcile with philemon he wrote to Philemon. He said, Philemon, I'm sending Onesimus to you. I would have retained him. He's a profitable man now. And he's a changed man now. He's a wonderful man. You will enjoy him. Receive him now. Not as a servant. Receive him as a brother in Christ. That's reconciliation. 
That's a peacemaker, making peace between the master and the servant, between Philemon and Onesimus. And then he said, if he has wronged you, or if he owes you out anything, put that on my account. If this Onesimus owes you anything, count it to me that I, Paul, the apostle, am owing you that amount. Then he said, I, Paul, have reaching it with my own hand. I will repay it. Whatever. And you know that I'm just I'm a full-time worker. I'm an apostle. But out of my nothingness, I will find the money and I will pay you back. Look at peacemaking. Look at peacemaking. It was so committed to see that there was reconciliation between Philemon and Onesimus. That's the attitude you ought to have. That's the attitude everyone has to have. When you see people having disagreement, having conflict, don't go to one side and encourage the other side. Don't give in. Don't submit. Fire for fire. Stone for stone. Abuse for abuse. And force with force. Show him. Don't do that. Be a Christian. And let us be peacemakers. You go to this side and you say, what's the matter now? He owes me. Okay, can I help him and pay you? It, it, it's the money that I sold. That's all you're asking for. Once the money is paid, are you settled? Yes, I'm settled. I'll, I'll pay it. You will pay it. No, I don't want you to pay, but I, I want you to have peace. If it is the money that is a real problem, I'll look for it and pay you. And the fellow might say, if you are this serious about settling this in between me and so and so, all right, I've heard. We'll settle it between ourselves. That's how to be a peacemaker. And then it says in verse, in verse 19, I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it, albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, even thine own self besides. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Do this, and I'll be so happy. You see, that's how to reconcile people. I pray that the Lord will make every one of us peacemakers in Jesus' name. I need a good amen. amen. I can tell when you want to go and sleep, but I'm not going to allow you today. Night be jail today. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Point number two now, persecution of peaceful children of God. The persecution of peaceful children of of God. We're looking at Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. That's the persecution abusing you, insulting you, belittling you, degrading you, trampling over you, and gossiping against you, and slandering you, lying against you, persecution. And yet, we know why they persecute. In Galatians chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4, reading from verse 29. Galatians chapter 4, verse 29. But, as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit even so it is now it tells us the major root cause of persecution those that are born after the flesh they persecute those that are born after the spirit those that manifest the works of the flesh they persecute the people that have the fruit of the spirit. Those that are unrighteous persecute the people that are righteous. Those who belong to the devil persecute the people that belong to the Lord. And it happens like that. It happened like that before. It is still happening like that today all over the world in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12. Yea. And all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's the reason why there's persecution. To live godly. To live righteously. All that will suffer, all that will live 
godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The Lord Jesus tells us in John chapter 15, reading from verse 18, John chapter 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love its own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Here the Lord Jesus Christ says, when you are persecuted, you need to understand. It's because you belong to me. And it's because I've chosen you out of the world. And you will not run with the people of the world to the excess of royalty. And to the evil things that they do. And to the iniquity that they practice. And to the sins they commit. And because you come out from among them. And they are unhappy. Well, we're not smoking together before. And now you are proving too holy, holy. You don't smoke anymore. Were well, we not drinking together before? And now you are telling us you don't drink anymore. Are you telling us that we are sinners? I'm just saying the Lord has delivered me. And the appetite for those things of the world, they are not in me anymore. Now you are worshipping idol together before. This is the idol of the family. What are you saying now? I'm not quit. I've then run away from the dead idols and I'm now serving the living God. Ah, if you don't serve this idol with us, you're going to see something. That's why there's persecution. When you will not compromise your stand, when you say, Here I stand, God helping me, and I don't plan to change. I've laid my hands on the plow and I'm not going to look back. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who died for me on the cross of Calvary. And I don't plan to ever disappoint the Lord. I love the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind. And I want to do the will of God and obey the word of God. And I don't ever plan to change my mind. That's why they persecute you. It tells us in verse 20, remember the words that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sins, they will also keep yours. They will keep yours also. We're told in chapter 17 of John. John chapter 17. Reading from verse 14. John 17 verse 14. I have given them thy word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world that's the reason for the persecution when you distinguish yourself when you differentiate yourself when you come out from among them you are walking in a place where it appears that the bribery the bribes they take is almost like their main source of income the salary is almost like pocket money and then you became born again you're now a child of god and then you say by the grace of god now even the ones i did before i'm going to make right my ways i'm going to make restitution and then they send you out in teams and the uh, big man the boss is waiting back in the office that all the bribes you collected You'll come and give him. Then he'll give you maybe a particular percentage. Then you come back after the day's job. And all the others, they are reporting back to master. And they are saying, you know, we got this today. We got this today. Wonderful man. Wonderful. Wonderful. That's very good. And then, how about Mr. So-and-so? I've not seen him. Come here. Why are you not on duty today? Did you go out today? Did you not, uh, you know, there was no roadblock or whatever today? Come in here. And then as you, as you come here, you say, yes, sir. Am I asking for attention? Where is it? You say, sir, I'm now born again. And so what? No more bribes. What? We will not eat. 
Because you are born again. I warn you. If you come back tomorrow. And you don't bring what you ought to bring. You know I'll show you. Second day you went on duty. You didn't take bribe. You came back. Persecution will begin. All your colleagues. All the others. They will persecute you. And the man there will persecute you as well. But you have raised your hand to the Lord. And you have said, I have chosen the way of truth. I will not go back. You will not go back. Yeah. I have given them thy word. And the world has hated them. Because they are not of the world. Even as I am not of the world. They will persecute. But thank God you will stand. Yeah. In First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. What do you need from verse 14? First Peter 3, verse 14. But, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror. Neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you for a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evil doers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good works, your good conversation in Christ, for it is better. If the will of God be so, that he suffer for well-doing than for evil doing. Therefore, always understand, when you suffer for righteousness, that's much better. If you are, you are not suffering as an adulterer, you are not suffering as a fornicator, you are not suffering as a person that got pregnant before marriage, you are not suffering as a thief, you are not suffering because they investigated you and they found that you have been robbing the company, but you are suffering because of righteousness. You ought to be happy, you ought to rejoice in the Lord. Psalm 7, reading from verse 10. We go to the Psalms. Psalm 7, reading from verse 10. My defense is of God, which saves the upright in heart. God judges the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. If he turn not, he will wedge his sword. If he does not turn away, he will wet his sword. He has bent his bow and made it ready. He has also prepared for him the instruments of death. He ordained his arrows against the persecutors. We are not to fight the persecutors ourselves. The Almighty God in his own program, in his own economy, in his own administration, he has ordained his arrows against the persecutors. Behold, he travails with iniquity. He has conceived mischief and brought forth falsehood. He made a pitch and digged it and is falling into the ditch which he made. His mischief shall return upon his own head and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own page. I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness and will sing praise. So the name of the Lord most high. The Lord has assured us that there will be persecution. Therefore he says, marvel not. Don't be surprised. As if a strange thing is happening to you. And you know sometimes the Christians are not well taught. Whenever persecution comes, whenever those challenges come, it comes to them as a surprise. And uh, they become fidgety. And they become panicky. And it, it's like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? They are persecuting me. They are threatening me. Don't be surprised. Marvel not. Don't count it. A strange thing. I see some strange thing has come unto you. That's what the Lord is telling us. Look at First Peter. Chapter 1 verse 6. Wherein ye greatly rejoice. 
Though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold trials, temptations, that the trial of your faith, being more precious than that of gold that perisheth, though ye be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Christ. The Lord is telling us then we shouldn't be surprised when the seas come. We're looking at First Peter, First Peter chapter four, First Peter chapter four, verse twelve. Beloved, think it not strange, think it not strange concerning the very trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice in as much. As ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, appear ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer. If you are a murderer and you are suffering, that's not persecution. Or as a thief. If you are a thief and you are suffering, that's not persecution. Or as an evildoer. If you are an evildoer and you are suffering the punishment of your evil deed, that's not persecution. Or as a busy body, in other men's matters. If you are suffering as a busy body in other men's matters, that's not persecution. You are suffering for your ignorance and for your unrighteousness. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Yes, there's persecution for peaceful children of God. But you remain peaceful in a persecution. You, don't, you are not awful. You are not offended. You don't want to retaliate. You don't want to revenge. You don't want to change your pattern of peace. You still have the Prince of Peace living within you, even in that midst of in the midst of that persecution. And you don't want to change over and borrow their attitude. You don't want to change over and get into their nature, into their violent nature. You want to remain who you are, a child of God, in the midst of that persecution. Only then will that persecution profit you. I come to point number three. The profit of persecuted children of God. The profit of persecuted children of God. We're looking at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Reading from verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted. Fortunate are they which are persecuted. Favored are they which are persecuted. Happy are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Not because you are struggling over a lady, over the same lady, and therefore you are persecuting, punishing one another, not, not that one. Not because there's land. And then you are struggling. You want to get it by him by all means. That's not it. For righteousness sake. Not because you are greedy. And you are searching for something. Or you are selfish. Or you have a nature. Depravity. Carnality. Not that. But for righteousness sake. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. Whenever persecution comes, don't jump to conclusion. Ask yourself, in this matter now, where I'm suffering this burden, this punishment, this difficulty, was I righteous? Did I glorify God? Did I honor God? Or is it because of my carelessness and my foolishness or my iniquity? Or my backsliding ask yourself don't just lump everything up and say persecution persecution you are disciplined in the church because you did wrong because you committed sin and then your friends ask you what happened that's what i see they are persecuting me who is persecuting you look at my face does my face look like someone who can persecute somebody at all at all 
If I discipline you, that's not persecution. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Look up. If you are righteous, you'll be my friend. I'll appreciate you. How can I persecute you? That's what I'm preaching. I want everybody to be righteous. I want everybody to be holy. If I grab you, and then I do something to you to put pressure on you. It's not persecution. I'm a preacher of righteousness. If I discipline you, don't count that as persecution. That one is chastisement. It's discipline within the family of God. But if ye are persecuted for righteousness sake, that's what Jesus said. Then he said, yours will be the kingdom of heaven. What a gain, what a profit. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. When you are doing your best for Christ, the church will not punish you. So anything that comes from the church, don't count that as persecution. Maybe you are careless. Maybe you are not up and doing Maybe you are not making as much effort as you ought to make. That's not persecution. Just go on your knees and say, Lord, I thank you I'm not backsliding. I thank you I'm not, I'm not a child of the devil. I thank you I'm not a sinner. But my pastor expects more from me. He has high expectation of me. And because of his high expectation of me, even though I've done my best, my best have not reached that high expectation. That's why my pastor, because of his love for me, and because of his appreciation, he says you can do better. How could you do it like that? Okay, go and sit down. That's not persecution, my friend. But when the people of the world, when they persecute you and they speak evil of you falsely, then it says rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven god will reward you amen. give me a good amen. amen for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you second corinthians chapter four in second corinthians chapter four i'm reading from verse 14 second corinthians chapter four reading from verse 14 it tells us knowing that he which raised up Jesus, the Lord Jesus, shall raise us up also by Jesus and shall present us with him. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. God will give you abundant grace. For which cause we faint not. We faint not. You will not faint. You know, if at the time of challenge, at the time of persecution, at the time of trial, at the time of insult, at the time of abuse, if you fail, and you are not able to do what you were doing before. Now when I talk of abuse or insult, well, you need to understand, even our little children at home, when they have, if they have a chance to talk to you, I'm talking of those, uh, you know, have the children when you're unbelievers. At least I know when I was very, very young, you know, when uh, these uh, parents, if my daddy, for example, I'm talking about, you know, more than 40, 50 years ago, uh, if my daddy saw that I did something, I says, come here. And he, you know, stretch out your hand. I stretch out the hand. And then he whacks me and, you know, and all that. And I leave the hand there for him to allow him to finish. And when he finishes, I rub my hand and say, thank you, sir. And then I go my way. And my principal in the secondary school, whenever, you know, the, uh, something went wrong, and then he calls us, and he says, line up, and we line up. And then all the other people before me, they take their own, and they're screaming and all that. In fact, before it comes to my turn, I make up my mind, look at these people screaming for principal. I will not scream. And then I get, he says, bend down. I bend down for him. Ba, 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 ba. And then I stayed there, and then it's like he has finished, I didn't know he finished. Oh, I... <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm telling you something, but if my father said something, not stick, 
if he said something that I felt he was trying to belittle me or destroy my personality, that sin pained me much, much more than the stick. And my principal, he didn't believe in God. When I became a born again believer, I went back to him and then settled some scores with him. And I remember I was teaching in school and he said something. It, not even personal, but about the Bible. That was a, like a dagger in my heart. All the stick, I just leave my hand for them or my buttocks for them. All that did not matter. But the abuse, the insult. And it's like that with many people. When they insult you, when somebody says a bad word and belittles and puts you in the doors, very, very painful. The temptation is to reply them. Don't reply them. God will comfort you. That's why it says, we faint not. When they beat you, you might not faint. And when they deny you of something physical, you might not faint. Wait until they call you a bad name. And they tell a lie against you. And it pierces you to your very heart. And you are not able to sleep at night. And you are wondering so and so said, such and such about me. And that rotting word, that piercing word, may make you to faint. But you are here tonight, you will not faint. For which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, everything we go through in life, the summary is our light affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory that's the prophet an eternal weight of glory well we look not on the things which are seen but are the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporal but the things which are not seen are eternal we're going to make it in jesus name you see, your persecution will not destroy you. Your persecution will promote you. Yeah. And if you have had some persecution already, be waiting, the promotion is coming. Yeah. In Exodus chapter 1, Exodus chapter 1, verse 12. Exodus 1, verse 12. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. If you have been afflicted, if you have been persecuted, I'm rejoicing with you, you will grow. Amen. You will multiply. Genesis chapter 50 verse 20. Genesis chapter 50 verse 20. But as for you, he thought evil against me. Here is Joseph talking to his own brothers. But God meant it unto good. To bring to pass as it is this day. To save much people alive. Every negative thing in your life from this night. They will turn to positive. Yeah. All things work together for good. For them that are called of God. Called according to his purpose. My dear sister, you have been persecuted at home. Dear brother, you have been persecuted in your family. My friend, you have been persecuted in your place of work. The day of joy has come. Yeah. The night of tears and the night of sorrow, all that is over. There is profit with that persecution. Rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Don't faint. Don't give up. Don't turn back. Just yield yourself to the Lord and say, Lord, I thank you. You allowed that persecution for a purpose. The insult. The abuse. Like arrows and daggers in my soul. You have allowed it for a purpose. All the same. I'm going to be a man of peace. Are you a peacemaker? Or a troubleshooter? Are you a peacemaker? Or you a firefighter? Are you a fire for fire man? Sword for sword man? Insult for insult woman? Abuse for abuse lady? They throw it at you, throw it at them. That's not the way of Christ. Be a peacemaker. Promote peace. 
live a peaceful life anything in your mind anything in your heart anything in your character anything in your relationship that will not contribute to peace in the body of Christ or in your family or in your place of work or among friends or among your neighbors and co-tenants get rid of those things be a man of peace be a woman of peace don't let conflict emanate from you if they say there's conflict in any community don't let it originate from your doorstep blessed are the peacemakers a peacemaker will shun all strife all discord a peacemaker will run away from all kinds of fighting whether it's psychological fight or physical fight whether fighting with words or fighting with action a peacemaker will run away from everything that's related to fighting and strife and contention be a peacemaker blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God a peacemaker will labor with all his might to prevent the fire of contention from burning from being kindled and where that fire of contention is already kindled a true peacemaker will endeavor to calm the stormy spirits of men quieting them down their turbulent passion sorting their minds so they will not contend again reconcile them a peacemaker or reconcile Saul and David a true peacemaker will do his best to reconcile by Lehman and Onesimus these are the true children of God the peacemakers and even in persecution you retain your peace peace of mind peace of heart a peaceful lifestyle a calm gentle unruffled lifestyle you maintain a posture of peace the language of peace the action of peace be a peacemaker even in persecution don't let it originate from you and define persecution properly according to the word of God when you are rebuked for your carelessness that's not persecution that's the recompense of your foolish action just say I'm sorry and let it go let's solve this problem once and for all when you are disciplined for not being your best and we know you can do better and we really appreciate you and we expect better greater things from you when we don't see that we rebuke you that's not persecution that's just correction that's telling you you can do better than that don't count everything as persecution but when persecution does come from your unbelieving neighbors bear the persecution with proper comportment and retain your peace and then the Lord will see your attitude and your action and the Lord will bless you and you derive gain and benefit from that